Now, the Bible reading tonight comes from uh, Ezekiel. Um, it's a, a wonderful thing, Sam. It's a, it speaks to the heart of an orthopedic surgeon uh, to talk about bones. So um, it's chapter 37, verses 1 to 14, and uh, you'll find that on page ooh, 724 of the normal Bible or 860 of the large print. So if you want to find that page... 724 or 860, and we'll hear about bones. <clears throat> the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out into, in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones, and he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley. And behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, <clears throat> bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them. But there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from, my, from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. Please do take a seat and turn back to Ezekiel 37 with me. Let me add my welcome to Simon's. My name is Sam, uh, if we haven't had the chance to meet yet already. Uh, there's a chance that we, that we haven't, because believe it or not, it is actually summer, and that means that some people are away, some people are visiting us only briefly. And we've actually had a lot of folks kind of come and go from Trinity over the years, but uh, if you were here with us all the way back in those deep, dark days of COVID, you'll probably remember our sermon series in the book of Revelation. That's a book many of us can feel confused or intimidated by. But you'll remember how we learned that in reality, that great final book of the Bible is kind of like an art gallery. It's a collection of striking, memorable images, all expressing one very simple message. One truth that has been of great comfort to the church down to the years. In the end, Jesus wins. So you have this spectacular, bizarre, at times frightening imagery that so often perplexes us, but it's actually just conveying that one very simple, very comforting truth. Because we might, I guess, understand in theory that Jesus will one day crush Satan once and for all, that one day he will set the world right. 
sometimes that just kind of rattles around in our heads and it doesn't always actually take root in our hearts. But if we maybe read an image of Christ on a white horse riding out to fight a massive seven-handed dragon, then we really start to feel it. It kind of sinks in in a new way. So as confusing or as intimidating as the imagery can be, it's a very striking way that God has chosen to plant the truth of his promises deep in our hearts and our, and our minds. He uses it to engage our, our intellects, our emotions, and our imaginations all at once. And Revelation's not the only book of the Bible to use seemingly bizarre imagery to express the core truths and promises of the gospel. In fact, much of the imagery in Revelation is not original to Revelation. It's drawing on and kind of remixing the prophetic literature of the Old Testament, and in particular, the writings of the prophet Ezekiel. And chances are, confused and intimidated might be exactly what we feel when we open up a book like Ezekiel and try to read it as 21st century Christians. It's full of fiery pronouncements of judgment, there's these creatures that kind of look like enormous wheels inside wheels, and they're all made of eyes, and they're spinning around, and they're on fire as well. Ezekiel eats a scroll at one point, and there's some accusations against God's people, the language of which might rattle our more comfortable middle-class sensibilities. But we don't have to feel intimidated. This is still God's word, and these books of prophecy were written to reveal the, God's, the will of God to his people, to reveal it, not to obscure it, not to confuse them. And what I want to do this evening is just to simply take one of the more well-known, maybe one of the more accessible uh, visions in the book of Ezekiel and highlight the ways in which it serves as a perfect picture for what Christ has accomplished for us through his death on the cross. But before we dive into this passage, let's, let's pause and get our bearings for a second. I don't know uh, what sort of image your mind conjures up when you hear the word prophet. I tend to think of some sort of like mystical old wizened crow sitting up in a mountain somewhere. He's staring into a crystal ball or the entrails of a dead chicken. He's trying to discern something about the future. Well, thankfully, the biblical prophets are actually a lot more straightforward than that. These were ordinary guys, chosen by God to convey extraordinary messages. In many ways, they were actually just there to remind God's people of things that they already knew. And they were most active at a time when God's kingdom was splintering. God's people had split into a northern and a southern kingdom, Israel and Judah. They had rejected the covenant that God had made with them in the days of the Exodus, as we've been thinking about over the past few weeks. And they were just barreling towards destruction and judgment and exile. If you think our nation's a bit of a mess, go read First and Second Kings, where a lot of that is detailed. And then into this mess steps the prophets. In many ways, they, they acted a little bit like lawyers. They brought this case of a broken covenant to God's people. They warned of the sentence of judgment by exile, should they not repent. That's where all the more terrifying or shocking imagery tends to come from. But they didn't stop there. That's not all that they had to say. In their pronouncements of judgment, they also extended promises of grace for repentance and looked beyond the coming exile to a day when the people would return to the promised land. And then even beyond that, to a day when the Messiah, when God himself, would come and redeem his people forever. There's a saying, it's been attributed to a few different people about great art, that it should comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. I think there's an element of that in the prophets. They rebuked those who had become complacent in how they broke God's covenants. They brought this frightening sentence of judgment, but they also provided great hope and comfort to the remnant who would end up surviving that exile. And I hope that that context can help. There's a little bit of a structure that recurs in the prophets as well of kind of judgment pronounced on God's people, judgment pronounced on the nations that would attack them, and then beyond that to a hope of restoration. And that context and that structure, that can be of great help to us if we find ourselves reading a passage from the prophets 
For instance, we're just diving into Ezekiel at one point here, so it helps us to get our bearings. There is actually a method to what, I guess for many of us, can sometimes seem a bit like madness, and it can safeguard us against all the harmful, crazy, context-ignoring interpretations that have plagued the church for years and really thrive in the age of the internet. The prophets were not a bunch of aloof mystics. Really, they were just preachers of God's word. They preached the warnings of judgments and the promises of blessing that the covenant contained to remind a forgetful and wayward people of who they were. And like many great preachers down to the ages, they knew how to use imagery and illustration to really drive that point home. And God gave them these great visions full of this great imagery to be able to communicate that to their people. And one such vision is exactly what we find here in Ezekiel 37. Who was Ezekiel? Well, he was living in exile in Babylon around the time that Jerusalem fell and a great act of judgment from God. He kind of sits on either side of that. That happens partway through the book. He was actually training to be a priest, but now he's a priest without a temple. He's trying to minister to people who had been complacent while their capital city stood and were now utterly despondent after it had fallen. Like the rest of the prophets, he was just an ordinary person, given the words to say by God in order to convey the truth that his people needed to hear. And this passage then comes as that arc of the book is starting to bend up towards hope. It points directly to the restoration of God's people as a nation under the old covenant, but it also glimpses beyond that. There's hints here of what Christ would accomplish for all of his people in the time of the new covenant. It's a, it's a beautiful source of hope for the believer. I think in so many ways, a perfect little visual metaphor for what Christ has done for us. We're gonna look at the three ways that it shows us that. First, we're gonna see that dead means dead. Second, that redemption means resurrection. And finally, that life means life. So let's start with verses one to three. Dead means dead. Now please don't mishear me when I say the words dead means dead. That's not some atheistic declaration that once you're dead, you're dead, and there's nothing more after that. Don't worry, I, I very much believe in the gospel's promise of, of resurrection hope. But the reason I say dead means dead is that I think it's really easy to forget just how dire our spiritual situation is without God. When we read in the New Testament that we were dead in our trespasses, it really means dead. It's very easy, especially if we've been Christians for a long time, to kind of like register that on an intellectual level, but to forget what that really means. We hear it, we go like, yeah, sure, copy that, and then we move on, maybe to something that sounds more uplifting, without pausing to grasp the severity of that statement. Because death isn't trivial, is it? It's not something that can be swept under the carpet, not something that can be ignored or glossed over. It's a painful and horrifying reality in this fallen world. And Ezekiel finds himself face to face with that reality in this vision. So the Spirit of God, in verse 1, lifts him up and comes and sets him down in this valley full of bones. God leads him through the valley to survey it in verse 2, and he sees that there are very many bones on the surface of the valley and that they are very dry. And there's a lot to unpack here in what might seem like a simple observation. First, the fact that there's nothing but dry bones tells us that these people have been dead a long time. Carrion birds and exposure to the elements have done away with the rest of the remains, and these parch husks of calcium are all that's left. Then there's the fact that they've been left out on the surface of the valley. They're out in the open. They've been denied a proper burial. Burial. 
That would have been one of the greatest insults you could have inflicted on someone in those days. And actually, I'm sure probably many of us today would feel the same if someone that we loved was denied a proper burial. So not only are they as dead as dead can be, they've also been stripped of their dignity as well as their flesh. And it's a striking image. It calls to mind those pictures that you see of, of war zones, of Nazi concentration camps, of the killing fields in Cambodia. I remember once seeing a pile of bones that had been left in a field after the Rwandan genocide. It's bitterly, bitterly grim. And that might have come as a bit of a surprise to the original readers when the last chapter ended on this great note of restoration and hope. If you just look across to 36, verse 26. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. And I will deliver you from all your uncleanliness. I will summon the grain and make it abundant and lay no famine upon you. I will make the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field abundant so that you may never again suffer the disgrace of famine among the nations. So we've gone from all of that to a valley full of dry bones. Ezekiel now finds himself staring out across the bleakest of all possible landscapes. What is God trying to tell him here? Well, if you look down to verse 11, you'll see that in the depths of their despair, the exiled people of God were crying out, our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, we are indeed cut off. It's a harrowing thing to hear there is a sense in which they've started to grasp the reality of their situation. To rebel against God is to reject the author of life. It's to give ourselves over to, to chaos, to destruction. In the face of God's just wrath, we are undone. We cannot stand. Left to our own devices, our hope is lost and we find ourselves with a one-way ticket to the Valley of Dry Bones. And if you're not a Christian here tonight, I, I don't say any of this to just spout doom and gloom for the sake of it. I want to point you to the only hope in life that matters. Because unless you accept Christ into your heart, this valley is where you will reside. And for those of us who are Christians, may we never forget that there but for the grace of God go we. May we never grow complacent or apathetic about what Christ has accomplished for us when he took our place in that valley. Because we weren't just rebellious in our trespasses, we weren't just stubborn, we weren't just lost or wayward in our trespasses against God. We were dead. But God does not ignore his people's despairing cry. You might have noticed in this passage he's referred to as the Lord, all caps. And if you've been with us through Exodus, that might start ringing a bell. That means that the original, in the original Hebrew, it would have been written as his covenant name, Yahweh. I am who I am. It's the name by which he revealed himself to his people when he brought them up out of Egypt. And that would stand to remind them forever of his steadfast and unwavering love. And in their rebellion, his people might have forgotten such love and such faithfulness, but he hasn't. It's who he is. So in verse three, Yahweh asks his prophet, son of man, can these bones live? Son of man, can these bones live? live. Now, how would you answer that question if God asked you that? Maybe it would be a cynical, no, they're dead, obviously. 
Maybe you're a born and bred church kid and you're just leaping out of your seat to give the Sunday school answer. You know, actually, God, you have the power over life and death, so obviously you're going to make them alive again. I was going to say we all knew a kid like that in Sunday school. I I was that kid in Sunday school. Uh, Ezekiel takes a different route. He simply responds by saying, O Lord God, you know. That might seem a little bit non-committal at first glance, like he's just taking his place on top of the fence. But what he's doing is actually quite wise. He no doubt recognized the supreme power of God over life and death. But he wasn't presumptuous about that either. He knows how sinful the people of God have been. That God could have chosen not to help them now that he'd rejected his covenant. It's maybe a question less about whether or not the Lord can raise his bones, but rather if he actually wants to. I mean, think about it. His beloved people had turned their backs on him. He trampled his covenant underfoot in their rush to chase after other gods. I feel like many of us, if we found ourselves in God's shoes, we would probably think that enough was enough. We wouldn't want anything to do with them anymore. Well, thankfully, the Lord isn't us, and he answers his own question in truly spectacular fashion. And that brings us to verses 4 to 10. Redemption means resurrection. Redemption means resurrection. So if I were to give you a paintbrush and a canvas and ask you to paint a picture of what happened to you when you became a Christian, what would, you, what would you put there? Well, you couldn't go wrong with painting a scene similar to what we see in these verses. Having handed over the fate of the dry bones to the wisdom and the sovereignty of God, Ezekiel is then told what to say in verses four to six. Then God said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Then with that same humble submission that he displayed in verse 3, Ezekiel then prophesies, just as commanded, in verse 7. And what happens? How is this question of can these bones live answered? Well, look at verse 7 with me there. As I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews upon them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. It works. Kind of. Uh, we, we end up getting this strange moment where the bodies have been put back together again, but they aren't actually alive. They're still corpses. If you're familiar at all with the Gospel of Mark, it's a little bit like that moment where Jesus heals a blind man in two stages. At first, the blind man can see, but only partially. He says that the people that he does see kind of look like trees walking around in the blur. Jesus restores his sight in two stages, making it kind of specific points. And here again, we have only the first stage of restoration. We have the bones set back in place, bound by sinew and flesh, coated in skin, but there's no breath in their lungs. So then there's this second stage in verses 9 to 10. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. It's also a little bit like the the creation of Adam back in the book of Genesis, First, he's formed of the dust of the earth and then filled 
with the breath of God. Every spark and speck of life in his body came from God, was fashioned by his hand, was breathed from his lungs. And here it's exactly the same. The words that command the bones and the breath, they're all put in Ezekiel's mouth by the Lord. And that would have actually been a great source of hope and comfort to the exiles who first read and heard this. They have been stripped of all that they had, like flesh from a corpse. They're living under the shadow and the thumb of an oppressive foreign king. They had no political power, no economic influence, no military might. They were brokenhearted and despondent. They had nothing even resembling the type of strength that it might take to restore them as a nation. But that didn't matter because the life the strength, the vitality that it would take to put them back together again, to stand them on their feet again, to make them breathe again. That would all come through the Lord God. And for us today as Christians, having been redeemed from our trespasses, it's been the exact same. We are powerless to free ourselves from death, powerless to bind ourselves to Christ. Only his action, his willingness to die on the cross for us, to bring us into loving union with himself, only that could have ever redeemed and resurrected us. And a couple of the commentaries I, I read in preparation for this evening also pointed out how this two-stage resurrection actually gives us an image of the role of God's word and God's spirit in bringing dead sinners to life. We may have friends or family members who are far from God, who are, I guess, living in death. We lack the power to resurrect them. There's nothing in us that could bring them to Christ. What they, what they need is to hear God's word proclaimed like the bones did in verses seven and eight, and then to be filled with God's life-bringing spirit as in verses 10, nine and 10. Actually, that, that Hebrew word that's translated as breath, wind, or spirit throughout these verses, it's all the same word. The breath that fills these bodies is the spirit of God. When God's word and his spirit works together in the empty husk of a human heart, then it starts beating, blood starts flowing, lungs start breathing, and a dry cluster of bones stands on its feet, joining the number of this exceedingly great army, the people of God. If we were dead in our trespasses, and if we have been redeemed from those trespasses, then that redemption was in and of itself an act of resurrection from God. And it's not just that they're spared from death here. It's not just that they're brought back to life and told to just kind of get on with it and hope for the best. They're raised for so much more. They're raised so that they can truly live. That brings us just briefly to our final few verses. Verses 11 to 14. Life means life. Life means life. What we read in these verses kind of echoes what Jesus promised when he said, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. Just sit for a moment in that despair of verse 11. Behold, they say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. and We are indeed cut off. Our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, we are indeed cut off. That is what is rattling around in their heads and their hearts. Have you ever felt like that? Ever felt that for all you say you believe about God, for all that you really do believe about God, you just can't see any light in the darkness? What the people of God needed to hear was not just that they would survive the exile, not just that they would keep on existing. Surviving doesn't 
really quite feel the same as truly living. Now, what they're promised in these verses is more than that. It's restoration to a life better than what they knew before. Look at verse 12. Therefore, prophesy. The same command that he was given to say to the bones, he says to God's people. And say to them, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and when I raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it declares the Lord. They would be able to return home, and there they would be filled with the spirit and the knowledge of God to to serve him in ways that they never could before. And here's where those echoes of the gospel really start to get loud. The cross of Christ is such a prominent moment. It kind of echoes forward into the New Testament and backwards again into the Old Obviously, the direct, immediate context is a message to the exiles about their return to the promised land. It says that pretty explicitly in these verses. But we know from when we read the Gospels that the returned people of God didn't quite look like how they're described in these verses, maybe. There was still rife disobedience, corruption in the religious leadership, despair at being under another nation's thumb. But that doesn't mean that this promise didn't come true. We also know that all the promises and prophecies of the Old Testament find their yes and amen in Jesus Christ. Because it was only when Jesus came to walk the streets of that promised land, only when he took death upon himself, only then was the power to raise dry bones to life made manifest on the cross at Calvary and at the empty tomb. Only his life, death, and resurrection could secure that great outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost that filled the believers, that gave birth to the church as we know it today, and that spread the knowledge of God to the ends of the earth. If you're a Christian here tonight, you you might not feel like anything particularly special has happened in your life. I know it's, it's easy to feel that way. Like Maybe you're still just the same old you that you've always been, but now you, you go to church, you read your Bible, you pray. Has anything actually really changed? Well, know with confidence that what Christ has accomplished in your heart is every bit as spectacular and wonderful and awe-inspiring and earth-shattering as what Ezekiel saw in this vision. God, by the power of his word and his spirit, has brought life where there was only death before. I've been alluding to the phrase, dead in your trespasses, a lot tonight. And that comes from Paul's letter to the Colossians in the New Testament. If you just want to turn with me to that, uh, to chapter 2, that should be on page 984 or 1169 in the large print Bibles. Colossians chapter 2, I'll read verses 13 and 14. And you, who were dead in your trespasses, And in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. In Christ, you have been raised from a pile of dry bones to a living, breathing, spirit-filled believer. And so if, like me, you maybe often get that in your head but struggle to really just feel it in your heart, then turn to Ezekiel 37 and let the prophet show it to you in a fresh light. And don't let the fact that it's, you know, 
prophecy puts you off. Don't feel like you need to be intimidated by its strange or striking nature. Don't feel like that's somehow beyond your ability to understand or comprehend. Again, these, these are words written for God's people. And the prophets are full of promises like this that ring true in Christ and really help us visualize the reality of the gospel in our lives. It's the word of God. And by his spirit, he will open up our eyes to behold the beauty in the gospel of dry bones. Amen.